Um, this general thing could be improved sometimes, but well, you know, we can't do everything. So the next speaker um, is Adria Mittelkorb. He also got his PhD from the University of Utrecht um, on his work on attribute grammars. He's actually from the same group as uh, Beto. And uh, meanwhile, he has been doing a postdoc in Paris in Indonesia. He's currently working with a company called PowerD. Vereinigte Wirtschaftsdienste, which have their implementation headquarters based in Heidelberg, and he's going to tell us something about declarative workflows using attributes. Uh, yes, hello everybody. So the last year I've been working on a uh, workflow system tailored to financial consulting, and it's. Um, it's actually based on very rigorous techniques from compiler construction and functional programming, uh, which help in order to, to deal with some of the flexibility that we require in order to help these financial uh, consultants in their, in their daily lives. So, um, as, I, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at workflows. So basically, workflows is like a collection of tasks to, to be done by, by the user. And um, so I basically have three, uh, three important words here. So I'm going to look at declarative workflows. Um, so you know, so this, this workflow system is going to specify what is to be done, but not how it is to be done. And that's actually so much something that I heard Wouter say also today. So there is actually some kind of, well, it, it's kind of on a meta level, it has some kind of similar idea, I think. Um, uh, with the difference is that it's not only that the programmer is going to say uh, is that the programmer is alleviated from the fact that he doesn't have to say explicitly in what order, but also that the user that is actually using the system does not have to follow the order that the system is, um, might suggest as the, the user before. Um, now, a lot of, of um, a, a lot of workflow systems that are kind of procedural that are based on uh, control flow graphs, and um, what, I'm, what I'm going to say here is I'm going to base this on on data flow graphs, so it's a bit of a different setting, um, which is more suitable to the fact that in a, in a consultancy setting, lots of things are dynamic and lots of things are are changed, and uh, uh, data flow graphs are, are more suitable to, to track changes and stuff like that. Um, also, then, um, uh, in order to, to kind of have a data flow graph as a model, you kind of need to generate it in some way, uh, similar to, uh, and again, I will make a comparison to what Walter was saying, he was kind of saying, well, if you have di diagrams, you also need to describe it in some way, so you need to some a very good way of describing that. And um, in a way, this is going to, uh, um, what I'm going to use for that is, is attribute grammars. And in a way, um, the kind of, what we have seen before, what Waldo was presenting, is kind of a combinator language for, uh, for diagrams. Actually, if you use attribute grammars to implement it, you get an even nicer way of writing it. So, it's actually, in a way, I'm going to tell you at the, at the meta level about ideas that are existing shown, uh, already for a long time in compiler construction. Um, and also in functional programming, that can make your, your, your life a lot nicer if you're deep up with um, So I'm going to talk about grammars also, and if you, if you looked at, at Beto's, if you attended Beto's talk, then you also saw that he was doing stuff with, with grammars, to model stuff, and generate stuff from that. So there's also the correspondence there. Um, so in order to, well, why, why would I do that? So, um, well, but first, before I go into the why, let's let me just give a, give a rough sketch. Um, and the sketch is, so the kind of way that I want to model these, uh, these workflows is to say, oh, I, the kind of tasks that are part of this workflow, I will model this in a, in a tree, so with uh, the task as the leaves. And um, between these tasks is some kind of data flow, because uh, the, these tasks are really relatively independent of each other but uh, they, will, they will need inputs, and when you complete a task, they will generate outputs, and these need to be somehow transferred to other tasks. And in order to kind of specify how this data is going to be transferred from one task to another, um, I'm, I'm claiming that the tree is a very good way of modeling the kind of uh, data flow. 
Um, so, but first, why would I, why would I do it? So my, I have a use case, and that's in uh, financial consulting, where there's like a financial advisor that on the one hand might have customers that, that need advice for particular securities, or, well, maybe the, the consultant is actually managing the, the estate of a, of a client. And in this particular area, there's maybe due to the financial crisis, maybe due to other factors, there's, uh, the lives of those consultants has become more complicated, um, particularly due to increased regularity, regularity pressure. Um, there's a lot of rules, so basically this entire consultancy process uh, needs to be documented and there needs to be guarantees that what the consultant is saying is somehow matching the knowledge and the um, experiences of, the, of, the, of their clients. And uh, that means that they have to actually do more and, they, and well, on the other hand, you do all kinds of other factors. Um, the market gets, gets also more transparent, also due to, to these rules, so it's harder to, to, to keep your, um, your clients. So on the one hand, they actually need to do more work, and on the other hand, they actually have to be more efficient. So this can also mean that they will make more mistakes, and which is then bad because there are severe penalties to that. So um, we need a solution for that. We need to help those consultants, and that's basically the company that I work for is uh, what it's doing. Um, so Power Day is um, well. Some people might know it from, from uh, because they also uh, deliver data about. Uh, securities to newspapers and so on, so they, they are kind of a source for these data so that you can, can often see in certain newspapers. Um, in the area that I'm working in, or the, the part of the company that I'm working in, we are developing a financial advisory suite um, that, are, that are basically there to support these advisors. And one of the key strengths of, of this application is that we have access to actual and historical data about securities, which means that if you need to give it to that, um, financial advisors that you, you have the actual data, you, you know exactly how you can compute um, kind of real time of um, what kind of estate a client has and you can simulate stuff. So that's very, so we have a, a lot of nice tools for, for a, a financial advisor to, uh, yeah, well, to, to have this consultancy, or to, to do this consulting. Um, and what I've basically been working on is providing a framework so that we not only um, provide these tools to, to a consultant, but also to guarantee that the consultant uses these tools in a um, well, in such a way that it, that it meets these documentary and, and other uh, rules. So, because it, it might happen that, a, that the advisor kind of forgets to, to use the tool or, or use the tool in such a way that he gives advice that. Um, uh, does not match the, uh, uh, the knowledge of the customer. Uh, so the kind of workflows that I'm uh, looking at, um, so it's not like business to business workflows, uh, workflow systems, so that's, that's kind of simplification, you're looking at systems where there's an interaction with the user. Um, and they, they kind of look, look like this, so you have, a, you have a couple of forms that you need to fill in, um, and after you filled in these forms, well, you usually get a document or maybe some more complex things, or maybe some trading has to be done. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the kind of requirement that we have is that well, there might be an a, a, a order uh, suggested by the system to, to fill these forms in, but um, you need some kind of freedom to, to go to a particular form, to go back, maybe change things, and so on. Um, so, so let's let's look at some of the um, of the of, of the things that are that are kind of important for this type of, of workflow. Um, so I've got a couple of screenshots which I will go through rather quickly. So um, first, my first thing is oh, we model these, these workflows as a tree. And the question is, well, is it a tree? Well, um, on the one hand, we have this like a navigation area with, with, where there is a um, a tree of pages. And um, well, if you then select one of these um, uh, pages, you get a, a content area where, where you will see there's a, like a tree of controls somehow grouped in sections. Now, uh, we can also see if you look at the navigation area, is that there's like active and inactive pages. So um, 
Uh, the active pages are the pages that you can somehow jump to and then do something with the contents. And inactive pages are somehow, at this point, not, not reachable because you may not finish everything. You may not have to in the new quiet stuff to, to get to that, to that page. On the other hand, uh, so a lot of these pages are, are already accessible, even if you are at the beginning of the, um, uh, of the workflow. Um, well, so yes, it's, it's like a tree. You could, you could see it like this. You have like, uh, suppose that at your ending page, you kind of selected that you had like persons A and B, and for each person, there, there might be some kind of uh, pages or forms to, uh, to fill in. Um, Moreover, these kind of trees are not entirely static, so you don't really know them perhaps already in advance, uh, because the, the kind of data that you have might, uh, so if you have like a, like a page where you can select the kind of things that you want to do in this workflow, then, the, um, well, then your tree, tree might uh, change, and also kind of change the length. Or you might go back and say, well, I want to also look at this particular uh, aspect or this topic. Uh, moreover, so uh, as I mentioned before, at some point um, there will be need for documentation, so you want to generate maybe some report, and maybe then find out, oh, there's something wrong in this report, maybe there's a spelling mistake or so, so you want to go back and then change something, and then the system needs to make sure that then this report is then also automatically generated. Um, yeah, so in this tree you can also imagine that there is like like invisible steps that are that are doing kind of system actions. <clears throat> um, and then finally, what, what you also typically see in these kind of workflows is that there is a um, that there is a point where, where you need to make sure that, that certain things are checked before you can continue. So not every tool or not every form is immediately possible, or you cannot always go directly in there. Um, you might need to check some stuff. Um, so the you may need to, to do some sequential stuff, or, um, well, basically some kind of gatekeeper functionality that says, um, well, the kind of things that you that you entered there don't fit together. Um, so even when you model these things as a tree, there might be some kind of point where you say, well, first do everything before, and then um, we check if everything is okay, and only then you can continue. Um, so given these kind of things that, that these kind of elements that occur in our in our workflows. Um, let's look at the various ways of how to model these um, these kind of things. So typically you'll 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 see uh, that that there is a, a model that these things are model with, with control photographs. And you often also see that in yeah, like graphical editors for, for specifying needs. Um, so the question is, uh, so if you have a control flow graph, you can also look at, at, at the model, you can also look at the data flow graph. And then uh, you can ask yourself, which of these two models is uh, more suitable for natural conserving? And then um, one of the observations is, if you look at the control flow graph, then it's actually very hard to see what the, the influence of changes is. Yeah? If, I, if I go back to, to maybe my entry page and then change the number of persons, yeah, what, what kind of stuff in my workflow do I actually need to redo before I can, uh, can finish this kind of workflow? Because I might need to, to do some pages again. Um, so that's actually easier in a, in a data flow graph. Because in the data flow graph I can see, uh, see, uh, see a couple of things differently. Because I can see maybe from the entry page, I can go to my financial situation page or directly to my experience page. So there's these two are independent of each other, so I can actually do these two in any order. Um, and if I change when, maybe a value in one of these, ex uh, in, in my financial situation page, then uh, you can kind of follow these arrows and see what you then have to redo, or what potentially needs to be redone. Now, one of the uh, difficulties here is, um, so this, this data flow graph may be pretty big, yeah, because if you, if you think about it, if you have like a couple of forms, and every form has a number of, of data uh, data fields, then each of these values will be kind of an arrow, somehow going from that page into a couple of other pages that are dependent on this value. And um, 
this is kind of implicit in the control flow graph. In the control flow graph, you say, well, I have kind of an order between my steps, and I implicitly assume that if something follows, if one step follows the other, then all the data that was done in that step is kind of implicitly available in the next step. Um, so there you kind of have less errors, so less, less but, um, which makes it easier. And on the other hand, it makes it harder to see the state changes. So um, for this financial consult financial consultancy process, it's actually uh, a better model. In my opinion is actually based on a data flow graph, and that's the kind of thing that I'm advocating right now. Um, now, if you I want to categorize so where does this, this approach kind of fit together in, in all the related work in a sense, because there is like every major vendor has its own workflow system implementation and so on, uh, several open and source ones. Um, one might say, or you might say, well, the majority actually is based on a, on a procedural uh, model. So control flow graphs, factory nets, and so on. And the kind of thing that I'm looking at is more. Uh, well, fits into more of the other three categories that, uh, uh, that some people came up with, um, that some people described. And actually, I think uh, it's categorized on, uh, uh, as a case handling system. Um, so, case handling is, is kind of defined as that the state and structure of the workflow depends on the, on the kind of data that is, that is uh, being uh, written as part of this workflow. Uh, and that's basically what we, are, uh, what we are doing. On the other hand, it's also functional in a way because we have these kind of, um, well, we have kind of functional data flow graphs in this, uh, um, so there is a, um, uh, so, so we're basically looking at, at, at the various <coughs> aspects that are, um, well, Let's say we are looking at, at stuff that's functional, but also declarative, and then fits into this case in the uh, category. Um, so one, one particular nice system that's, uh, that in the functional work world ex uh, exists is Clean. Uh, and clean is ICAS, which is written in Clean. And for those that know this, uh, basically what I'm talking about is that um, the Clean system is based on the concept of monads in, in a way. And what I'm talking about is, 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 is more like arrows. The first, um, so that, that's, that's, let, me, let me start talking about the, uh, the system itself. And essentially what I'm, what I'm first going to tell is what, what do grammars actually have to do with both flows? Because normally people associate grammars with, uh, with parsing. And in a way, actually, uh, Pedro has been, uh, has been talking a bit about grammars as well. And there's, there's also some correspondence with that. Um, because if you have something that's like a grammar, you can do parsing, you can do generation. So it's, grammars are actually a very nice thing to model stuff and do, do nice things with it. And I will actually show that, that there is then also a relation to work. So let's start with a very simple grammar. And for presentation purposes, I actually took a very uh, simple grammar. Um, uh, basically, it's 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 uh, kind of the only thing that you can parse is like a a b, um, but that's um, that's that's enough for for this presentation. So um, first question. So, so first the thing is, so what what is this? Uh, so how do how does a parser work in, in essence? So you have this grammar, and. Um, what, what basically happens is that, well, you, you have a, usually you, you have a, like a, a scanner to, to working together with a parser. So the, the scanner kind of says, well, I, uh, so the, the parser can kind of ask the scanner, give me, a, give me a token or give me a symbol or something like that, give, give me a character or something like that. Um, so, the, so, so the scanner, is, so, uh, so the parser says, well, uh, I, I want to build this kind of what my grammar represents and ask them for a token. Uh, so the, the scanner says, well, here's an A. Then, well, depending on how your parser works, if it works from button up, uh, if it works button up, then it kind of constructs, uh, constructs the tree from bottom up going to the top, or if it works from top, top down, then it kind of starts at the root and um, 
and build the tree by asking the Alexa for, uh, for signals and then continuing to, to build the tree a bit further. Um, so, um, so what happens is, so, so what, what, what kind of people find out in a, in a we were working with fasters in the past is that um, well, you're typically not always interested in the tree itself because your tree might have much more structure than you're really interested in. Um, so what you usually do is you, um, you're interested in a value computed from this tree. So in a way you annotate a new grammar and you say something like um, where, you, where you annotate well, where you write functions that says uh, the, the value for this node is somehow a function of the values of my subnodes. And um, in a way, what you're then doing is you're building some kind of data flow graph that goes from the bottom to the top. Um, that takes the information that is coming out of the scanner and um, combines some of this information into, into something that, uh, that you have at the, at the top. And um, well, if, you, if you can that data go from bottom to top, the questions can also go through this in the other way. And indeed, if you have a top-down pass, <coughs> then um, during building this tree, you can actually compute data that goes from the top to the bottom and deliver somehow context information, um, which you can then feed to the uh, For instance, to the scanner, maybe uh, typically where this is used, if you do something like layout-based parsing, where you can then tell uh, the scanner, well, there's, I, I was here in a, in a context where there's maybe uh, uh, there's maybe a place where, uh, where, where, where there was an equal sign or something like that. Um, so if you do top-down passing, you can actually compute values. You can actually have a data flow that's coming from the top to the bottom, which is then used to somehow configure that uh, the scanner, for instance. Or if you can take it further, you, if you can, in a similar setting, you can have information going from left to right. Um, so now the, the crucial idea is, uh, what does this have to do with, uh, with workflows? So in a, in a sense, uh, you can use the grammar to build these kind of data flow graphs, which, as I showed. Um, now, how do we get to these tasks? Well, the, the key observation here is that um, it's not necessary for the, for the scanner to kind of work on streams of, of, of characters. No? Um, in a way, you can look at it in a more general way and say a, um, a scanner could actually uh, not recognize characters, but this could actually uh, generate tasks. So either uh, say, so, so if the parser says, give me a, a token A, then the scanner could say, well, um, I know then that I either have to generate a, path, a, a new task A, or I need to recognize if I have already, or if the user has already done that. So anyway, it's not really a scanner anymore, so I'll give it a different name, like workflow executor or something like that. Um, the fact is, um, so in a way, parsing is, is, can, can be seen as a bit more general, as somehow an interaction between something that builds a tree and, and a data program, and something that then gives you the tokens. Uh, and then, you, so these tokens are then more like task applications. Um, so that's, that's, that's the basic idea. Now, um, there's one more thing. Um, if you have, so if you have this data that's kind of coming from, uh, so what, what I didn't talk about is how can you get these dynamic trees? So what if I want to make information that is, uh, <laughs> that comes somehow from the left, um, how can I make this information somehow affect my, my tree structure? So one way to do, that, to, uh, to do that is to say, well, um, the, the tree itself depends on its value that is coming from the top or coming from the left. So um, it's also usually called something higher order because in a way what you're doing is you're, you're having a value that's basically the tree itself, or the more abstract value grammar itself that you pass as a value um, and then you can do some things like, uh, um, depending on, on, on some kind of Boolean switch that you, you got from the, from the left, or you take, or you take that particular tree, or you take another tree, and in that way you kind of encode, can, can encode conditionals and, and stuff like that. 
Um, now another thing is what I was saying before is uh, if you have this, if you have information that kind of goes from from the top and from the left, then it kind of forces a particular order, and we want to get rid of that order. Um, so in order to do so, instead of requiring that the scanner, or in this case, more this, this workflow actually is, is, is doing things from left to right, is you can kind of, kind of relax that restriction and say, um, the, um, so, um, the, as, as soon as there is like a data flow coming, so as soon as the, the, the kind of all the inputs for a particular task uh, are kind of reachable or kind of uh, are there, then this, um, so, so as soon as there exists basically a data flow to a task, then it, then it can already be executed. So in this uh, particular example, that means that the, uh, that, that for instance the two A tasks, which are totally, in, in terms of data flow, are totally independent, um, and even the B, can, execute, can be executed in any order. On the other hand, if I would also allow that, if I allow it also that there's information flow then, so I can now also allow information flow from the right to the, from the right to the left, because I'm now not really restricted in doing things from left to right, um, then there's actually only one possible uh, sequence of tasks, namely BA. So basically going from, the only possible sequence is now doing the task from right to left. And, um, the thing is that the, the kind of grammar that describes this, this particular picture, that's what is called an attribute grammar. Um, so written, and the, well, the kind of, to say, the kind of parser that kind of implements that in, in terms of Haskell would be an error. Um, so let me go in, in, into a bit more detail. Uh, detail. So I've, I've here the, the kind of, Basic picture again. So you have this, this tree structure that you can describe with your grammar, and then you have the individual tasks which are kind of built into the system. And the, the grammar then describes how this data flows between the tasks, and then you have kind of the components that then then evaluate this thing and something. So, um, so how does the so what's the general architecture of the of, of this approach? So we we have kind of a uh, a description of the of the workflow as an attribute grammar. Uh, so that's basically the code that is being fed in. That's basically describing the uh, the workflow, or with which you can then compile in some way using an attribute grammar compiler um, uh, to the form of an evaluation algorithm. So in a sense, if you look at it, at it in Haskell terms, then it would be an error. Uh, well, and if you evaluate that, you can you can get basically this picture with these attribute trees and this data flow graph. Uh, and that you can execute, then you get what I will be talking about is like this tree structure that you have as a, as a front end of everyone. So there's you have kind of two models. So one model is kind of what the, what the front end or the GUI is kind of using and you have the, the, the model that is behind it as an attribute kind of. So we need uh, let me discuss then this model that is kind of underlying the, um, uh, that is kind of going to the front end. So uh, that's basically what was visible in one of the screenshots. So we have like an organization in a tree of, of groups, pages, and tasks, where a task can either be an individual control or maybe something more complex like an entire page. That's, uh, that's a matter of granularity. Um, so in a way you can imagine that this is like like a, the data model that is being operated on by the front end, and it's kind of replicated between back end and the front end. And uh, the kind of operation that you can do is you can pick out one of these individual tasks and submit some kind of value to it. And that then kind of uh, affects them in the entire tree. Um, so that's kind of the, that's, that was kind of the external representation. Then you can look at an internal representation. Um, in this internal representation, there's like, uh, well, when these nodes of this task tree, they have like attributes also. So inputs and outputs, where the inputs are the, well, they mean, first, there are a lot of nodes actually in this, in this internal tree. So the nodes are like 
uh, building construction. So we have like one for a group, one for a, for a page, one for each possible control that you have. Uh, and they have like a, a fixed set of attributes. So maybe a user, uh, maybe a user control has a name and a description. Um, and um, well, it, which then appear and maybe a type so that it appears as a sort of a, a widget on, on the screen. And um, well, it, it has as its output a value, basically the value that was, was put in there by the user or changed by the user. And um, the idea is that associated with these building constructions, there is also a function that says, well, if you have given me those inputs, then I will know how to compute these. Uh, I have a little bit of local state, and I will know how to compute these outputs. Um, so, imagine that you have like all, that you have for all your types of controls, you have these um, these building constructions. The question is, of course, how, um, how can you then then build this this, this um, task tree structure, and how do you get this information flow between these uh, tasks? Um, and there you want a, a bit of flexibility. So that's where then the attribute trees come in, which are then described. These attribute trees will be described by the um, attribute gram. So essentially, what I, what I will be looking at is kind of a model of this, so a logical model of this workflow, which is not entirely the same as this external representation that you can see as a user. It's usually bigger because it kind of represents the data that is logically part of the workflow. And um, there I wanted the two things. So this, this, this bigger tree, in, in a way, describes this, this, uh, this task tree that I mentioned before that is going to that is being used as a model for the front end. Um, and in addition, specifies the, um, the information in the flow between these um, nodes of that tree. So I, I, wrote, I put it here in this picture as the, so that the darker, the darker nodes are those of this this other tree, so I put some red lines in between to show the, the tree structure that it had. And actually, the, the tree that I'm that I'm wanting to describe in my attribute grammar is the uh, are the bigger nodes. Um, so uh, basically, what I want to do is uh, let's go back. So these, these blue nodes have like a fixed set of attributes, and uh, which are which are which are which I need somehow need to connect to each other. So I need a way to describe that. And for that, uh, I need to define a, a data flow, and I can do this locally. Um, so in a sense, what I, what, how can I do that? Well, so every node in this, uh, in this um, attribute tree, I can have a set of attributes to the left which, of the node, which I, will, which I will consider as input attributes, and I will have attributes to the right of the node, which are also as output attributes. Um, but now you can classify what does it mean for, if you look at the node and its children, what does it mean, uh, how, what, what can I see this data flow? Um, so I can have data flow going from what I would say from source attributes to target attributes. And that's, and if you look at it in a very local perspective, then the, the sources can be input attributes of the parent, basically because that's information that comes from the top. And you can have the outputs of the children, which the information comes from the, from the bottom. So that's going to be your sources of your data flow, and then you can feed it to targets, which are basically the inputs that you, that you have with your children, because they will want their attributes to be filled in some way, and the outputs of the node itself. And so between these things, between the sources of the attributes and target attributes, you can put in arrows, or basically the small data flow graph, and uh, the way to do that is to specify a function. So you basically write functions that take source attributes and put to the target attribute. And that you do for each node, and then um, what you can then do is if you do this locally, you automatically get it globally. Um, because you only need to do this in a, in a very localized setting, and then the, the thing to get this, this global uh, graph is uh, by simply combining these things, and that's the system. Uh, that. So, um, so, so what does the system then need to do? So basically, what you what you'll see is that so you, you kind of have this data flow graph, 
And in the way what it has to do is it's, you start at the top, you, you assume that at the very top of the error, the values are available, then you kind of flow this information over all the arrows until you, uh, until you reach the, uh, the particular nodes of, um, uh, if you, until you, you reach the leaves. So then as soon as the, as the leaves kind of have their information to, um, uh, so as soon as the, as the leaves have their um, have all their attributes filled, then you can make it incorporated into the task tree, and um, it either continues, or if, if it has um, so if it has all its inputs and so on, you can then it can then produce its output attributes, and then incrementally kind of continue in this in this tree. Um, but as I mentioned before, actually you only need to describe this this local data flow, but even that. Can already be tough because you can have well you, you can have nodes with many children because basically every every control will be a node in this uh, in this in this tree and um, well you can imagine that you have also very a lot of attributes because you cannot you need to somehow specify how a value that is at one point in the tree ends up somewhere else in the tree so you might have many attributes and because of that you might have or you, you will have many functions between these attributes. So even the local uh, data flow graph is, is, is big. And for that, um, there's a solution, namely that's actually what the attributes grammar is helping you with. So in a, in a sense, an attribute grammar is, is not much more than, than basically a notation for the pictures that I presented previously. Um, with the addition that uh, you can give these kind of functions between the attributes in in arbitrary order because these are like functions, so they don't have side effects, so the order doesn't really matter. Um, you can group these things in, in a way that you want. Moreover, this, this allows you this, this kind of notion of compositional and modular that Waldo was also talking about before. Uh, in addition, so many of these, these kind of attributes have very simple rules or simple functions because you're kind of transferring a value from one point in the tree to another point. So there's a, there's a lot of patterns there. So there's there, in this in this research that it's about that, that exist for attribute grammars. There, there are many patterns or abstractions for that, so that you can write very concisely how data flows from one point in the tree to another. Um, and of course, the system can do this kind of notation. If you have this as a model, you can do a lot of analysis to make sure that you, you don't make mistakes. Um, now. To find out how you actually write this, so if you want to, if you want to know uh, how to actually write it, you can ask, uh, there's a, you can, there's a there's a tutorial on attribute grammars available on the on the web. Just search for the, um, just search for his name, or go to the link that I put in the slides. Where there's an attribute grammar system for Haskell. Um, and there you will find information on how to do. How to write attribute grammars, um, but this, but this potentially, uh, back to this slide. Um, what's, what's potentially more important is what's the kind of key message that I at the meta level have for this presentation is that as soon as you have like a problem that kind of has a tree, and from this tree you want to derive a data flow graph, then you should consider using attribute. Um, so normally, attribute grammars are something that are used in, in uh, compiler construction. Um, so in, in compiler construction, these, these, attribute, these, these uses of attribute grammars are usually more complicated. Because you, in a compiler, you usually have very deeply mutually recursive trees um, with, with very complex circular wiring and so on. Now the, 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 the thing is, if you use this in an airport area, like in this case financial consulting or workflows, then uh, it changes the it changes a little. So we we actually have more wide and shallow trees with with only uh, with only little recursion, uh, which actually simplifies uh, matters a lot. And um, the thing is that um, these these kind of the kind of message that I want to give you is that uh, attribute grammars are not only useful in, in, in this compiler setting, but there is a yeah. There's, there's basically a, a bigger setting where they are useful for. 
um, I, to, to finish, so what is my, uh, so what did I talk about basically? So declarative workflows, it's basically you want to describe what, but not how. Um, the tree structure is important, so this workflow is kind of uh, task organized in a tree, and then we have kind of functional, we use the attribute grammar to define functional data flow between the uh, set of tasks. And that gives us a system to um, yeah, basically have financial consultancy to do that work. Um, and if you want to know, to know more about attribute grammars, there's, um, as I mentioned before, there's one there's a tutorial on the web. And there's also a, a voucher also uh, has written an article on Moment Reader about Um, yeah, so that completes my presentation. Any questions? I have one. Uh, who is going to, or who is supposed to write these attribute grammars? Because you're going to like, have to reflect tax laws or financial laws or all these regulations, is it aimed at lawyers or financial experts or? Uh, so, so essentially, what I'm aiming for in this case is that there's still programmers that are writing these workflows. So, so in, in a way, if you look at many of these workflow systems, they, they kind of claim, well, if you have a kind of graphical interface to, to write these things, then arbitrary user would do that. But that's typically not the way that these kind of things work because you but maybe a normal user would kind of put blocks together with an arrow in between. But uh, the thing is that you usually have such such amount of data that you actually want kind of a programming language to, to describe these things. So a normal user is usually not really suitable to. Well, I mean, you need to be a, you need to know about programming in order to write these kind of things. Even if it's like a very simple graphical representation, what you're basically doing is programming. So you need to know about programming. In order um, so, you need somebody, so you need a programmer that, that knows about the kind of regulations that are there, um, that knows how these, how financial consultants uh, work and what, what is basically a good process to, to have. Now, a good thing is, uh, actually due to regulations, many of these uh, processes are going to be similar because if every bank um, has to be the same laws, then we will also have very similar processes. And for that, what you basically want is um, you want to have like a, a, a description that, that covers the common case and then extend it in some way. So their modularity is a very, also a very important concept if you, yeah, if you basically have different banks as customers. Um, so you have uh, shown, or you have, you have mentioned that there is this attribute grammar framework for Haskell. You are most probably not writing your code in Haskell, or is it kind of, I mean, are attribute grammars fixed to this um, esoteric function languages, or is, well, is there broader applicability? So, um, well, let me put it in this way. So, um, um, so there, there's for attribute grammars, there's, there's like implementations for a lot of languages. Um, so that this system is actually implemented, that I'm talking about is actually implemented in Delphi. Uh, on the other hand, I've, that's just like, that's like the initial version, so I've actually been thinking about uh, how can I get, how can I separate these things a bit so that I can actually use parts maybe of the, of the Haskell system that exists, for, for instance, um, to reuse more, more components and so on. Um, and so, so I'm actually hoping that there is that there is some way of using existing components not to have to, have to do everything in there all the time. On the other hand, you can also find attribute grammar systems for Java. You can have them. Um, well, I guess a lot of programming languages have some kind of system for that. Great. Uh, thank you. So coming up is the lunch break, uh, and we'll be back here, and the facts go on, and the tutorials go on at 2 o'clock.